What's up? I'm doing a quick little CD review, CD album review of <laughs> Jethro, Jethro Tull's stand-up album released in 1969. Um, mm, what more can I say? Uh, it's their s second album. Hang on. This was... This was Stand Up Benefit. Yeah, those are the three first stand up. Wait, huh? how can this be 69? Because Aqualung was in, wait, 71? Black Sabbath, 1970. I think Aqualung, 1971. So Benefit, probably 1970 as well. Anyway, this album is uh, 60s, in other words. And I do declare that uh, when most of us think of music from the 60s, uh, we associate it with stuff like, you know, the Beach Boys, just sort of clean cut, like, do up, do up, type of shit like that, uh, on one side uh, of the <laughs> Western pop rock spectrum, and then on the other side, we think of bands like, uh, well, or figures like Jimi Hendrix and so forth. But uh, there were rockin' great bands back then already. Notably, one of my favorites, uh, Jethro Tull. So let's take a little peek into what Jethro Tull was doing in the 60s. Here we go. First track on this album called uh, A New Day Yesterday. Uh, honorable mention, right before we even jump in, uh, is to uh, drummer Clive Bunker. Not Clive Barker, nope. Clive Bunker, uh, he played on the four first albums. I'd say Aqualung was the latest, last one he was on. Phenomenal drummer. Uh, take a peek uh, at his playing here. The way he, you know, the way he plays beats, the way he plays fills. And it's funny because going through this album, there isn't really a single song with a conventional drum beat as we think of it, you know? None of the songs are just like, because it wasn't standardized back then. Okay, so we have every drum part of every song on this album is its own composition. And it's great. So, yeah. Um, okay, here we go. And... Oops, wrong track. And this first song is heavy, okay? Okay, starting off like a little blues number, right? Right? Wrong. Check out that drum fill. Double kick, by the way. Double kick. Also, this album features, I won't say prominently, but... Um, so it features double bass drumming. At this time, he had two bass drums in the set, and you can hear you can hear when he plays them because they're uh, they don't sound the exact same, which I love it. You can hear when it goes boop, ba, boop, ba, boop, ba. it's uh, it's a double kick in action. So fucking great already. Let's start that from the beginning. Has this subdued intro, and it just goes and boom, bow, bow, bow. And the way that the drum beat just works in this song is just it keeps it moving in a crazy way. Because it doesn't settle into like a, a, a typical uh, straightforward-ish groove until the chorus. So let's take it from the top again. Part. Yeah, let's take that from Jesus Christ. from a very typical blues progression in notes. Just the blues scale, the pentatonic with a couple extra notes thrown in there. Um, and then in this uh, verse, we actually go to a, a... It's like a minor scale. Just a very traditional heavy metal lick. Uh, so that's very cool as well. We go, go from straight blues to like heavy metal sound. Um, okay. Fills. Double kick. Man, I, I 
actually never paid attention to the double kick that much. Mostly, I think, because when I first listened to this album, I didn't know it was a double kick. And I first listened to this album when I was 10 years old. Uh, and then, at a later point, when YouTube came along, um, that's when I looked up um, like live performances of this era. It turns out that he was playing, yeah, with a double kick kit. And, and now you can sort of hear them, those parts clearly. I'm gonna rewind a bit. <laughs> stuck in this traffic hell let's take it from the top one more time you can just take it in while I concentrate on traffic until I get to a better spot no flutes yet by the way remaster but uh this cd pressing is i think this is the yeah this is the original cd that i listened to uh that i that my dad had in the 90s so it's probably some form of remaster but not one of the most current ones uh notably stephen wilson off uh, from well his own fame and porcupine tree fame has been uh remastering a lot of Jethro Tull albums, which I love, absolutely love Stephen Wilson, and then his remasters are gorgeous, but this isn't that, um, but anyway, so, you know, take 60s, uh, The Doors and stuff, uh, particularly on the second album, Strange Days, you can really hear them, like, experience with the stereo experience, and this is also, like, prevalent in, in some Beatles stuff, which is like, oh my god, they discovered panning now. Yeah, dude, let's just make the drum kit, the entire drum kit, pan it to the left and put all the guitars on the right. That'll sound like awesome, right? Great. But anyway, so it's not that unbearable here. It's just like we got the guitar solo pretty much, I'm sure, on the left here. And the, we get the flute solo, which is now coming in on the right here. So you might not be able to pick it up that well, but it's there. And it's, yeah, as I said, notably because you associate Jethro Tull with Ian Anderson and his flute, right? Well, I I like this fact that it's been like, you know, at this point already, this is their second album. So, you know, they made a name for themselves to be the flute band. But we're halfway through a solid, solid blues rock piece. And no flute yet. 
until it drops. Rewind a bit. Solo. takes a back seat. And then we get into a fun one with the most British, Jethro Tull, of course, British band, English. Um, and uh, this song has the most English title ever. It's called <clears throat> Jeffrey Goes to the. Uh, fuck! Fucked it up. It go, uh, Jeffrey Goes to Leicester Square. Now, not in the entire song, not a single Jeffrey or a single Lester Square that's mentioned. I just, <laughs> I just love the song title, Jeffrey Goes to Lester Square. Now, placing this song uh, second on the album, you know, these are, you know, very experimental times when it comes to structuring an album, structuring a sound for an album, structuring a track list. So, after that heavy, heavy stomping opening, we might not expect that Jeffrey goes to Leicester Square is where we're going, but we're going to Leicester Square, I guess, so. band, this guy plays the marimba now, and uh, shit, so, 
Well, anyway, I think the next track on this album is Bure, and it was probably my favorite one uh, growing up listening to because it's such a cool. And uh, at this point, I think pretty much that's maybe the most well known Jethro Tull song. So if you've heard one Jethro Tull song, chances are it's this one. It's of course Bach, I think. A rendition of Bach's Bure. Ingvi's done this as well, and it's a guitar piece, famously, or the classical guitar uh, arrangement for it. It's musically very cool, but I mean, you probably heard this before. Next up is what's this called? I forget what it's called. Fuck. A telephone wakes me in the morning. I gotta wake up to the man. I really love uh, Ian Anderson's uh, lyricism because he wrote lyrics in the 60s here especially about his life and you know his mundane day-to-day -day city life and it's just cool to hear you know what what that life was before like in this song it's pretty funny because he's in the city and he complains about, oh, the telephone awakes him in the morning. And uh, then he needs to get up and answer the call and blah, blah, blah. So he thinks he's going to go out to the country, right? Where no one can ring me at all. Because that's like the height of city life annoyances. And then the, the oh, just the hubris of it all is just fucking telephoning all the day. Ringing, ringing, right? And then stuff like this. And then he moves out to the, and then he goes out to the country. And then there's stuff in the countryside that annoys him as well. Like, told from a man in the 1960s so it's fun and so we get this uh yeah this like anecdotal retelling of what life was like back then in in, in, in England so it's fun to listen to the side forget what the song's called but it's a good song Thinking, uh, dude, thinking, blinking, seeking, 
because Pokemon first generation was around in 1969 already. This is a little known fact. <laughs> section of the uh, songs. There's going to be some flute solos, there's going to be some guitar solos, very cool, but again, uh, Martin Barre, Bar, uh, the guitarist, he didn't really start to shine up until a little later on in the catalog. That's when his technical proficiency really started shining through. Super, super great guitar player. Very, very solid technically and uh, stuff. But not very noteworthy soloing yet on this album. But the drumming in this part is spectacular again. So. that sounds as good to me. I think that is like the, the musical uh, pinnacle of perfection when it comes to music production or sonics of what you hear from music and in my case especially drumming there's nothing rivaling the sound of a 60s snare doing a 60s snare roll captured with 60s musical equipment. There's just frigging nothing that satisfies me more than that crackle of a thundering snare roll. Oh, Jesus Christ, when it was still like open and stuff. And the 70s came along, it became muffled, uh, uh, dampened, disgusting, disgusting. The openness of the 60s snares was uh, still something that I want to hear today. <laughs> and the way I tune my snares. Ah. Alright, fade now. Next song, very beautiful. Very cool, actually. Yeah. Called Look Into the Sun. And this is saying something, because at this time, when I was like 10, <laughs> I want to say, well, actually, when I was like 5 to 15, 16, 20 years old, if a song didn't have drums in it, it was an auto skip for me. But one, one that I can think of right away is like uh, Foo Fighters uh, on the, uh, what the fuck's it called? Foo Fighters One by One album. There's that one song which doesn't have any drums. And it's sort of boring. Tired of You, right? It's like a ballad. But, you know, it doesn't have any drums. And that, to me, automatically used to render a song pointless to me. No value. If there's no drums, I'm not interested. Um... But um, there's a couple of ones of those on this album, and they're both, despite them having no drums and me being 10 years old, 
I didn't skip them. I love them. Here's one of them. It's called Look Into the Sun. Uh, it's great. It's a little bluesy and stuff. Not not super out there, super creative, but it's still very nice. But you can listen to that in your own, in your own time if you want. Um, not gonna showcase. Not gonna showcase it right now. Uh, this one's called Nothing Is Easy. It wasn't my favorite. Um, it's kind of a bit. It, the formula is a little cheesy. It's like a trading off solo thing, and the vibe isn't really cool. some nice musical tricks up its sleeve later on but um and then the next song it's a, this is a 10 song album by the way so we're on track number seven now this one's called fat man right well we all know what fat man was fat man and little boy right wait was it little boy all right, so it's a different, basically an anti-war song, of course, and it's actually lyrically clever. Uh, and I didn't realize this when I was a kid. Ian Anderson, he is saying about don't want to be a fat man because, and then he says, you know, why the fat man isn't, you know, good. And then he says, I'd rather be a thin man because so and so. Uh, so this is like taken out of context or very much in the literal context of this song. It's like, whoa, it doesn't fly anymore because he's singing how fat people, <laughs> fat people are definitely way worse than, my God, I, than, than, uh, than thin people. But let's listen through it. It's lyrically fun. It's musically fun. It's short. So, and it has a nice little quip at the end there. Okay. Fat man. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, good. You don't hear 
hear a song like that in the in the in the eighties. I was about to say in the eighties, which we live in in the twenty. Uh, we've gone from what is wrong with music today. We went from Fat Man by Jethro Tull, great, to what was that one called? The what? What is her name? Trevor Smith. What is her name? All about that bass, about that bass, about that bass. No treble. This is like a, a diss track to that. What the fuck is it? Megan Trainer is that it? Trevor Smith. Megan Trainer is that her? Anyway, that song's like old by now. Old school classic, right? No, but it's a, it's fine, whatever. Uh, but the thing that annoyed me hearing that song was when she says, "It's all about that bass, about that bass, about that bass." No treble. At no point when she says bass. Does she actually have bass in her voice? She just does like an annoying vocal fry. Bass, bass. That's not bass. She's actually going into very much treble by just being by just making a vocal fry. It's all about that bass, about that bass, about that bass. That's not bass. Fuck you. Get your terminology straight. If you're gonna use music analogies for fucking body structure and, and weight, then do, do it right. It's all about the bass. She should have just like had a bass voice coming. It's all about the bass, about that bass, about that bass. No, drama. No, drama. And then she could have done a vocal fry. No drama. No drama. Oh, fucking music. Anyway, uh, almost at the end of the album. Now we get into the song which um, the Eagles notoriously stole and ripped them off. Uh, Hotel California. Uh, is basically very much this song, and there's a story about the Eagles, or Jethro Tull took the Eagles on tour, or whatever, he supported them, however it went, and, and uh, Jethro Tull was playing this song at the time, Eagles hung around this song a lot, a couple years later they uh, released Hotel California, uh, whatever, I think that's said by, mentioned by Egan himself. This is a very, very straightforward blues song, and this actually has... Yeah, let's go to the guitar solo in this because it's very proto guitar solo, right? Almost. It has a wah, which is used very badly, <laughs> unprofessionally. But the solo in this is actually very, yeah, raw. So let's keep an eye out for that. This is a good angle. Look at the shitty weather. We used to know. and there's notes overlapping when they shouldn't and it just contributes to just a really unique experience I think every take back then must have been 
just completely different from one another at one another and just hearing uh, a, a solo like this recorded is like it's like being thrown in the time capsule capsule or a time machine and uh, it's like you're really there because this was a real moment in time that was captured when this was played right it's it's like time traveling it's very cool to me now listening to it it's about those two guitar solos it's about the first one which it sounds almost like he's not he's not he's, he doesn't have the gain or, or the uh, uh, volume on the mics turned all the way up because it sounds like the, the notes are just dying out and he's not like getting the feel for it it's just like the playing is a little stilted it's a little awkward and then there's a short verse vocally and then he comes <laughs> back with that last solo and then he feels like he's dialed in it's like fuck yeah oh sorry I forgot to turn the fucking volume on or the mics on or whatever <laughs> And then he just goes ham, and then he gets so into it that he's overbending and stuff, and, and that's also something I love because later on, shortly after, I mean, already already on the Aqualong album, Martin Barre was very disciplined, very like almost clinical in his playing, very very clean. You can look up some or listen some some uh, his uh, like live solos from nineteen from the seventies. Astonishing player, fucking shredding his ass off, and then very clean, great thick tone, uh, sort of just like a, a, a you know. One of those really, really, really solid guitars, and hearing him here struggle with the maybe his own playing or uh, the gear, it's like yeah, love it. Anyway, so uh, coming up to the 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 beautiful song on the album, another one without the drums, and this, despite that, was my favorite song on the album, pretty much. Because check out these uh, flute arrangements and later on string arrangements, very beautiful. Alright, fading out. This one's called Reasons for Waiting. Surpasses and overshadows the 
vegetable cheesiness that makes it actually beautiful. started struggling a bit with his voice pretty early on in their career. Um, he has a very low voice and uh, fairly early on, I mean I'm saying 20 years into his career, he started really struggling with, with the higher notes and keeping in mind the register he sings in, they're not really high notes but still something, some, because of the way he uses his voice he has a hard time reaching his higher notes. Um, Especially later on, and you can hear it in the way he projects his voice. It's like he's going about it in an awkward way. But this is still in the era where he could, he would be more versatile with his voice, and he would be soft with his voice. And then, at some point, he started just sounding like a pervert, like a creep. He started having that raspy, that uh, in like I think the seventies, he started having that ah, this creepy fucking sex pervert vocal style. Which is fine. It's it's a rocking good time, but he yeah, <laughs> that's what his vocals turned into. <laughs> but uh, so it's really nice to hear him sometimes go quiet and cute and beautiful. Anyway, now we're going to the we're coming to the climax of the song. Versus him again singing and the very pompous and strings. But still, I mean, I've said gorgeous, I'll say gorgeous. And then we're ending the album on a true rocker. Now, this last song, you won't hear it, but you're gonna have to take my word for it. And, and I know this because I've seen live performances of this from this era. This is another song where the double bass in the kick in the drum kit is prevalent. The drum beat goes like this. Badu, badu, badu. And so, boo, 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 boo. That's a double bass part. You could play with a single pedal, no problem, but he plays the double bass. Badu, badu, badu. And then he does a tom thing. Boom, 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 boom. You can hear it. Anyway, so the cool thing about this next song is that it's very heavy metal. It's got a driving heavy metal bass line melody. Do, 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 do. And you'd assume that the guitar is following along, but the guitar is actually just playing a chord underneath. Man, I put two chords underneath. Anyway, let's, yeah. And this one's lyrically very cool and rebellious. I thought that this was a little, like, risque as a kid because he's, like, he's, like, he's, like, uh, showing up his mom and dad. He's, like, yeah, fuck you, mom. Fuck you, dad. Look at me. So I thought the subject matter was very, very out, very uh, rebellious. Anyway, here we go. It's called, it's called For a Thousand Mothers, which is also a very cool title.
and bass harmonizing here. fades out in solo. So that was the album, Jeff to Tell, um, Stand Up. One of my f fundamental, monumental albums from my childhood, uh, which is funny because, you know, I wasn't born in the fucking 60s. <laughs> but, still, I mean, not that late after, actually, you know, the, when I was born, the 60s were as close as the OOs are now. So, I mean, yeah, it's not far off. Um, but, um, yeah. I know Jethro Tull gets a bad rep uh, in in certainly hard rock and heavy metal and, and metal music scenes because of that one travesty where uh, Metallica is like in the 80s or something. Metallica was up for some fucking hard rock award with, I think, well, one Metallica album, right? One of the classics. And then Jethro Tull was also up for something. And then Jethro Tull nabbed the hard rock or heavy metal or whatever. Um, um, category that night, and it was like, fuck Jethro Tull, and I gotta say, of course, um, whatever, what Jethro Tull did in the 80s, I'm not, they went to like the ZZ Top, you know, purview, let's just sing about ladies and fucking underwear, and eh, sexual, eh, and Ian sounds like a sexy, horny creep, not even sexy, just a pervert, uh, and the music got dumbed down to like, it, it basically got ZZ Topified, um, so I'm not, you know, I like Jethro Tull way more than I like Metallica, but still, I, fair enough, I gotta say to that. But hey, great, great Jethro Tull albums is Stand Up, Benefit, This Was, Aqualung, The First of War. Then they morphed into something even greater. Uh, they got Barry Moore Barlow on the drums. Uh, Barry Moore Barlow famously played on Ingvi's albums um, in the early days and stuff. Great drummer. Uh, so yeah, let's delve into those another time. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed my ride home from... Uh, driving my kids to school. Haha. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love this. Wow. Anyway, have a good day.